Hello everyone, my name is Josh Powers, and in this video we'll be taking a look at the all new 3D texturing features inside Mixer 2020, which was just released. Mixer 2020 introduces a wide array of new features that enable you to texture not only Megascan's assets, but also your own custom meshes as well. We'll be covering all the essentials that you'll need to know to get you started with your own texturing. And if you'd like to follow along, you can find a link to the model and its baked textures that I'm using in the description below. With that said, let's get started. Before we jump into Mixer, I want to go over some of the steps I took to prepare the model for texturing. I used a pretty standard process for this spaceship, which means I first created a high poly and then baked its details onto a low poly mesh. This gives me a normal map, an ambient occlusion map, a material ID, as well as a curvature map. I transfer the details using Marmoset Toolbag 3, but you can use any 3D baking tool you'd like. And while it's possible to texture using only a mesh, the more input maps you provide, the more options you'll get in Mixer. Here's the high poly in Maya. As you can see, it's too dense to use in a game engine, which is why we've created a low poly model so we can bake the high poly's details onto it. And here's a low poly, which I created using the quad draw tools in Maya, and then UV mapped. The model still has plenty of detail, but it's going to be much less taxing to render. So let's head on over to Toolbag 3 and look at how we bake the maps. Toolbag has some really great features that give you a lot of control over your bake. However, for this example, we'll stick to the basics, which is a really straightforward process. All you need to do is load your high poly and low poly models, and then create a baker component and drag the models to their respective slots. Next, we'll adjust the cage to make sure the rays capture all the details of the high poly mesh. Then we'll tell Toolbag where to output the files, what to name them, and then what file type to use. And then we'll set the resolution to 4K. For the maps, we'll go ahead and select Normal Map, Curvature, Ambient Occlusion, and Material ID. For those unfamiliar, a Material ID map will bake a texture of the color values assigned to the different materials applied to your high poly model. Why is this important? Well, numerous software packages will use these various colors to quickly isolate and mask different parts of your model. We can use this in Mixer to apply different materials to specific sections of our object. To do this, just apply varying colored materials to the different elements of your high poly model based on how you want to break up the surfaces. Now that we've set everything up, all that's left to do is hit bake. And there you go. Now that we've got all the source textures needed to get started with texturing this spaceship, Let's head on over to Mixer. Now that we have a blank project open in Mixer, let's load our mesh, which we can do by clicking on the Setup tab here at the top right. We'll make sure the working resolution is at 2048, but don't worry, we can export at a higher resolution when we're finished. Next, we need to change the asset type from plain to custom mesh. This will allow us to browse our computer for an OBJ or FBX file. Once the mesh is loaded, we can then hook up the maps we just baked out. Do keep in mind that this first release supports single texture sets only, and we'll be unlocking that limitation in the next update. You'll find the respective input slots in the base layer of the layer stack. Just like we did with the model, let's browse to and assign the appropriate textures to their slots. The normal map and AO will both be visible in the PBR rendered viewport, whereas the material ID and curvature will not. However, you can preview the Material ID map by using the drop-down menu in the upper left corner, or by pressing 8 on the keyboard. OK, with the asset set up, we're ready to start texturing, so let's move over to the layer stack, which is where we're going to spend most of our time during the texturing process. Let's start by creating the base material for the spaceship by clicking the Surface Layer button. This opens up the Local Library tab where I can navigate to and load a Megascan surface. Let's go with this nice iron material. This looks pretty cool, but it's not exactly what we're going for on this ship, so let's add another layer on top of this one, which will act as a paint layer. And I'll go with this rusted metal. To the right of the layer stack, you'll see the contextual parameter panel. I'll want to change the reflectance values of this to make it look more like a yellowed and aged white paint. To do this, simply click on the color swatches for the different channels. And I'll also reduce the normal channel amount just a little bit. That's more like it. However, now we can't see the underlying metal that we loaded earlier. So let's create some edge wear to fix that. To do this, we'll need to create a mask for this layer by clicking the mask button at the bottom of the layer stack. 
As you can see, the contextual menu on the right changed, revealing a new kind of layer stack. This is called the Mask Stack, which is one of the most powerful features in Mixer. To get started with the Mask Stack, just simply create a mask component at the top of the panel here. And we'll select a curvature component, which will let us generate a curvature in real time based on the geometry, underlying layers, and the base normal map. Let's set it to edges and then invert it so that the paint is visible everywhere except on the edges. If you press 9 on the keyboard, you can activate the layer mask view so that you can preview your mask in real time to more easily see your changes. Now we can adjust the levels a bit to get our desired results, and we're good to go. Before we move on, let's create some grime for this metal. For this, I'll create another layer, this time just a solid color with a darker value. Let's create another mask stack and add an image mask component. I'll use the layer map option and reference the base layer ambient occlusion map. If we go back into the layer mask view and play with a few of the settings, you can see that with just a few clicks we were able to add some nice grime into the crevices of the ship, which adds a lot of character to the look and feel of this material. However, we can take this even further by adding some real world data to the mix by creating another image mask component. Then we'll reference the iron material layers texture data and multiply it over the curvature to make it feel more like dirt and grime has accumulated in various nooks and crannies as the ship was flown. This is a quick and easy way of breaking up the procedural look by utilizing data that we've already loaded into the scene. With this base painted metal created, let's save it out as a smart material which will allow us to reuse it whenever we want. Simply group the layers together by shift clicking them and then pressing Ctrl G and then just right click the group and select export as smart material. Once we've given it a name, we can hit export and it'll get added to the smart material library inside your local library. Now that we've created a group for our material, let's go ahead and assign it to its correct ID. Simply click the ID button at the bottom of the layer stack. This presents us with the available IDs that we can choose from. Or, with the mask thumbnail selected, you can hold down Q to see the IDs right in the viewport. When you click on a color, the group will then be assigned to that ID. Now let's save some time and use an already existing smart material for the next section. If you click the new surface layer button and open up the local library, you can switch the category to smart materials and find all locally available smart materials inside, both downloaded and custom made ones. Let's load this one I made earlier and assign it to another material ID. As you can see, it's behaving like any other material we could load, except it's using multiple layers that we can now adjust and edit to customize for our specific needs. Whether just fine-tuning the reflectance values or significantly changing the mask stack, the smart material can be edited however you see fit. With Mixer, we want to ensure that every hour spent is an hour earned. Utilizing the power and flexibility of smart materials is a great way to save time without sacrificing quality. I'll use very similar techniques to fill out more areas of the ship, using a combination of solid fill layers, scan data, and procedural masking. With the vast library of mega scans at my fingertips, and a very powerful and robust mask stack that I can use to blend them together, I have nearly infinite ways I can texture models quickly and non-destructively. And because I can save out any combination of layer blending and mask stacks as a smart material, the speed and ease of texturing my models will only improve with each project I create. One of the more iconic features of this ship's texture are the diagonal decals. Now, I could do this by painting my mask by hand, but there's an even easier way to do it using a mask component in a pretty surprising way. Let's create a new layer and take a look at how it's made. I start off by creating a solid color layer and then adding it to a group by pressing Ctrl G. I assign it to the proper material IDs and then give it a nice yellow color to complement the blues. I disable the normal layer since I don't want any depth, and then I add a mask stack and select the positional gradient component. If I position the range slider on the same value, I get a completely sharp transition between black and white. If I then hold shift, I can adjust both sliders simultaneously. Next, let's adjust this angle by using this gizmo here which will move the stripe into position. With the stripe in place, I'll add an image component above the gradient. 
And instead of using Layer Map this time, I'm going to select a library asset. This will let me choose any downloaded surface I have in the library, including imperfections, which work great in situations like this. I'll set the blend mode to multiply, and then tweak the range sliders to get some nice looking chips and scratches in the paint. Now that we have the main shape of the decal, let's make a new layer and give it a blue color. We can then clip the layer to the yellow one by holding Alt and then clicking on the layer. This will constrain its visibility to the area of the layer it's clipped to. Now we can go ahead and right click the previous layer's mask and select Copy Mask Stack. Then we can right click on the new layer and paste the mask stack. This will copy all the components, modifiers, and their settings. I'll delete the image mask since this layer is already clipped to the one below. And then all I have to do is adjust the position by changing the range sliders. And there you have it. Now I can add a rusted metal surface layer, link it to the layers below, and play with the settings to give the decals a little bit more of a weathered look. I'll go ahead and make some minor adjustments to the colors to compensate for the metal surface overlay. This is looking pretty good, but let's go ahead and add a curvature mask to the group so that the paint wears off at the peaks of the flanges. Super simple. Now I'm going to add some miscoloration to the hull by using solid color layers to add a bit more grime to the crevices. I use a curvature component with cavities only and then an image component to make the grime feel more like dirt. I also add some staining along the edges of the panels by using the curvature component as well as a blur modifier to help soften the effect. Then I'll play with the layer opacity to keep the effect, particularly the staining along the edges, a bit more subtle. I'm filling in the remaining untextured areas by following the same workflows as I've described so far. By using a mixture of Megascan's materials and solid color layers, along with the powerful components and modifiers provided by the mask stack, I'm able to quickly get texture coverage across the remainder of this ship. And by leveraging the different layers of the scan data as mask overlays, I can reduce the procedural look of the masks with resources that are already loaded in the scene. It's a very powerful and fun way to get your masks looking great in a matter of seconds. And since this can be utilized with all the surfaces, including imperfections, you have the power to make every one of your masks look realistic but truly unique. In addition to using materials and solid color layers, we can also paint freely on the mesh. For this texture, I'm going to utilize a paint layer to add a custom text decal on the side of the hull. With the paint layer selected, you'll see a new panel pop up on the left, showing the brush settings and presets. Loading a custom brush is incredibly easy. All you need to do is click on the brush thumbnail here, and then choose your custom grayscale image file. With the new brush loaded, I'll bump the diffuse value up to a bright gray, and then the displacement down to zero. By holding down S and the middle mouse button, I can move my mouse to quickly scale the brush up and down. I'll then line up the brush to a good spot on the mesh and then just simply click. The white is a bit intense, but I can tone that down by lowering the opacity on the albedo layer. I'll also do the same for the roughness layer as well. Now all that's left to do is to add a couple of mask components to wear away some of the paint by using the exact same methods as I used on the other layers before. Now that we have materials assigned to the whole model, it's time to tie everything together. The way I like to approach this is to create a top level group called Universal Grunge or something to that effect. Within this group I create details such as oil, grime, dust, scratches, and so on. I can still assign material IDs to specific layers if I find myself needing to, which can be helpful if you have a particular grime detail you might want omitted from a specific surface. But for the most part, these details will be applied to the entire mesh to really help give the material a more cohesive look and feel to it. I do want to quickly go over the technique I use for adding direction-specific dirt accumulation. Again, it's incredibly simple. All I do is add a mask stack to the layer and then use a normal component. The normal component acts much like the position gradient component, except that it utilizes the world normals to determine where the gradient is revealed. 
By setting the tilt to zero degrees and having it come from below, I'm able to restrict the mass to just faces that are angled towards the ground. And then by adjusting the range sliders, I can control the fall off of the mask. Again, I'm able to quickly break up any procedural look by multiplying scan data over the normal component. In this case, I'm just using the exact same sand that I used for the dirt itself. All right, so after making a few minor adjustments, uh, mostly just tweaking the color values on a few layers, I think this is looking pretty good, so let's go ahead and export. If we head over to the Export tab, you'll be presented with a number of customizable settings, such as name, export location, and so on. You can also choose the file format, which I'll set to PNG, and then the export resolution. I prefer working in a 2K resolution and then exporting at 4K when I'm finished. And then lastly, we have the maps. The standard maps will automatically be there for you. Albedo, roughness, normal, displacement, AO, and metalness. However, you may also want to channel pack the different maps into a single map, which is very common practice for many game engines such as Unreal. To do that, I could rename my roughness map and call it something like mask. And then I simply place the desired map outputs into the channels of my choosing, like roughness in red, metalness in green, and then AO in blue. However, in this case, I'm going to keep them all as separate maps, so I'll just change that back to the way it was before, and then hit export. And there you have it. In a very short amount of time, we were able to texture this spaceship using a combination of Megascan surfaces, color layers, and the powerful mass stack components. This is just one of the many new updates coming to Mixer 2020 this year, and you can expect to see a lot more features in the future that aim to give you even more control over your mix, such as texture sets, flipped UV support, and so on. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our beta testers for helping us refine and polish Mixer recently. As you can see, they've all had a lot of fun utilizing the new features we've implemented, and we're extremely excited to see what you'll be creating with this release. Be sure to check out the blog post in the description for a detailed explanation of what's available in this release. Having worked in the game industry for more than 15 years, I must say that this release is truly an exciting moment for me. With Bridge, Unreal Engine, Mixer, and Blender being free, we're seeing a new breed of professional quality tools available for anyone and everyone to use, eliminating the financial burden that used to come with being a 3D artist. What's more, Unreal Engine users are granted access to every single asset in the Megascans library, giving you a huge and unparalleled content library to help you quickly get your project off the ground. So be sure to sign up today. I hope this video was helpful in getting you started with this powerful new update to Mixer, and we're very excited to see what you create with it. Don't forget to tune in to Friday's live stream where we'll be giving a more in-depth overview of this update. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.